to say a word of prayer as we enter the word of God. Our gracious Father in heaven, I pray, O oh God, that you will take away everything from me that is unlike you. And as I seek to preach your word, I pray that you will anoint my lips, anoint my heart, touch my mind, and may only Christ be lifted up in this place today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. It is often said that where we spend our money is where our priority lies. You want to, if you want to figure out where your priority lies, just look at your bank statement. <laughs> sometimes you're spending your money, you're not really conscious of where you're spending. And when you, you survey your bank statement, you're like, ooh. So sometimes it's, it's, it's automatic spending. But not until you stop and, and do an audit of your finances will you realize where your, where your desires and your, your heart truly lies. And I hope today as I preach this word, we will, we will get a sense of where our priorities should lie. Because, as Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 33, we should seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. And sometimes we have such a misconstrued idea of wealth, uh, Steve. And as I was reading to prepare for this text, uh, Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 22, you can, you can go to it in your Bibles. I'm reading from the New King James Version. As I read the text, I recognized something very specific. And I will read it in your hearing, and you can follow it in whatever version you have. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 22. The Bible reads, Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. Verse 22 and last, it says, But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. Please underline that. He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Preaching to you today under the caption, I desire. Not enough. My sermon today will have three specific points. Three specific points. The first point that I will preach about today is his status. Three S's. Number one, his status. Number two, his search. And number three, his sorrow. What did I say? Number one, his his status, number two, his, his search, number three, his, his sorrow. Today, beloved friends, we're going to talk about the privilege of this rich young ruler. All three gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell us that this man was rich. In fact, Matthew tells us that he was a young man in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 22. He lived a life of privilege. The world was his and anything he wanted 
was well within his reach. Do you know any, any individual like this? When you think of, of such a man, you think of the Jeff Bezos of this world and the, and the Elon Musk's of this world and the Bill Gates of this world. You see, not only did the rich young ruler have privilege, but he also had position. Luke tells us that this man was a ruler in Luke chapter 18 and verse 18. This probably means, meant that he was an influential leader in the local synagogue. He not only had position, but he also had prestige. According to all the information we have about this man, it appears that he was very moral. Verse 20 tells us that he has kept all the commandments. He lived a good life. People all over that region in the first century probably looked up to this young man, rich, moral, religious leader. Wow. From every outward appearance, this young man was riding high on the pinnacle of success. He was everything a mother or a father could want a child to be. You see, if you looked at this man, you might think that he had it all. But sometimes appearances are deceiving. What do you say? Sometimes you see individuals and they're smiling on the outside, but you hear some news later on that they died by suicide, or they're having marital issues, or they're having issues at their workplaces, and they put on a front. Case in point is social media with the filters and all that goes along with it. You see, people put up something called a defense mechanism. They have all sorts of internal issues, whether it be doubts, fears, anxieties, and so they put up this, this outer shell as a defense mechanism. You know, maybe they had unresolved trauma that are still impacting them. And so they put on this false appearance and you think that everything is, is gravy and everything is good and everything is all right with them. But it's these same people. When you hear the stories, you're shocked and surprised. I never knew that they were going through that. I never knew that they were so depressed. What could have caused this to happen? And so, my friends, I'm so happy today that Jesus is able to pierce beyond the outer shell. He's able to pierce beyond the defense mechanism and see our hearts and our minds. What do you say? He's able to see our true conditions, and he's able to point out to us where we need to do better, where we need to rise to a higher plane, what we need to do to be more in line with his character and with his with his word. What do you say, beloved friends? And so everyone around this young ruler was in awe of him, but not Jesus. What do you say? Because as Jesus laid his eyes on that young man in laser-like fashion, he could see his true need. He was a man who had it all. In spite of everything that he had going for him, this young man had one mighty big skeleton in his closet. You see, when Jesus shook his closet, Jesus realized that he had a lot of work to do. You see, he had much earthly temporal possession, but with his much and many possessions, he had an itch he could not scratch. He had found that his youth had left him unsatisfied. You see, I was doing a course called Assist, and surprisingly, that, that course is a suicide uh, prevention course. And you know, you, you, would, you would think that it, it is people who have the least material stuff who are dying by suicide sometimes. Sometimes you, you think that that's what it is. You see, the question was asked in the class. Who do you think has the highest suicide rate in society? And everyone says someone who is poor, someone who has no material possessions. And the answers came flooding in. No, it's not those people who are dying by suicide. It's, it's the doctors. If you look at Hollywood, it's the people with a lot of wealth, a lot of possession, a lot of fame, a lot of power. 
What else could they want in life? Everyone is at their beck and call. But it's these people who are not satisfied. Michael Jackson didn't even have a childhood. Had everything he needed. Was famous at a very young age, but yet still he craved a childhood in his adulthood. And so he, he created the, Never, the Neverland Ranch. Wanting to be a child, wanting to fulfill that desire, my friends. But my, I'm positing to us today that if we look for the satisfaction for our needs in any other place than with Jesus, we're searching in vain. What do you say? You see, this man's money had left him feeling unfulfilled. But how can he be keeping the commandments ever since he was a youth and he's still unsatisfied? You may ask. Shouldn't this commandment keeping bring us joy and satisfaction and happiness and contentment with our lives? His morality, his clean living, his religious activity had not been able to satisfy the deepest longing of his soul. His swift climb of the rungs of the social and economic ladder had failed to give him what he wanted most, which was peace with God. You see, many people live in a world, maybe in this church today, who are in the same shape as this young man. You see, from every outward appearance, you see, we, we have made it in life. We, we have attained. See, life has been good to us in, in, in Newfoundland, Canada. See, we have some money in the bank. We have money in our investment accounts, in our RSP accounts, our TFSAs, in our RIF accounts, in our GICs, in our saving accounts, in our checking accounts. And for a lot of people, when your bank account is, is full of money, it, it gives you security. You know why it gives you security? Because you, you know if you have those emergencies, the ones that you can't plan for, the ones that just come upon you like a thief in the night, you, you have money put aside so you can, you can meet that need, and that is good. Don't think that the preacher is saying you shouldn't have money in your accounts. That is not the point of the sermon today. You should plan for the future. You should plan for your life with, with, with your family. You should make plans. Because the person who, who fails to plan, plan to fail. So don't think that the preacher is saying that you shouldn't have plans in your life. Understand that I'm saying that the priority should be Jesus and everything else should follow. See, people think that, that God has a problem with wealth. He, didn't, he doesn't have a problem with wealth. He has a problem if you're married to wealth and neglects him. If you look at all... The affluent people in the Bible, Abraham, God called him to leave his family and he left, and then he got land. He was affluent, but he put God first. But you listen to the word. So if you have money in your bank account, that's good for you. You can shelter yourself from a rainy day. You should do that. In fact, you should continue to invest. But make sure that as you invest and as you Acquire wealth, make sure you are depositing time and effort into your heavenly account. So you listen to the word of God. Bible tells us in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 20, not to not to store treasures on earth where wrath and moth doth corrupt and destroy, or where thieves break in and steal, but store your treasures up in heaven. Where none of this happens. You see, as I was speaking to someone this week, I was, I was telling them, you see, I've never seen a, a rich person take their wealth with them. You see, their families enjoy the wealth afterwards. It's put in some trust accounts, and, and the kids are set for life. But it's someone else who enjoys your blood, sweat, and tears when you go. And when you die, you cease to exist, the Bible tells us. You have no emotions, you have no feelings, you can't plan, you can't make plans in the grave. But the important thing is to die in Christ, where you know that you're only sleeping. 
And when he comes again, you will be raised to life eternal. What do you say, my friends? This young man had a desire. He ran to Christ. He wanted to know what he had to do to obtain eternal life. The Bible tells us he runs, which shows a sense of urgency. The Bible tells us he kneels before Jesus, which shows that he understands that there is something special about Jesus. I'm not sure if he identifies him as, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but he says, good teacher. You see, he, he, he regards him as a good teacher. Good teacher, he says. What must I do to obtain eternal life? The Bible tells us that he comes while Jesus is in the way. Which means that Jesus is in the middle of the road when he comes to him and bows down to him. And if you can understand what first century roads were like, it was dusty. It wasn't the well-paved roads that we have now, but it was dusty road. So he knelt down on this dusty road, which shows that he was not ashamed to admit that he had a spiritual need. Because you wouldn't find the scribes and the Pharisees doing this. Well, no, 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 they wanted to kill Jesus. He, he was claiming to be God. How dare he does that? So they wouldn't come. So, so I, I, I'm assuming that this wasn't one of them. This man wasn't one of them. He came to Jesus pondering issues of eternity. He wants to know how he might obtain an eternal life. You see, in Jamaica, we have uh, something called an evangelistic series. And a lot of times, people come to these series, and, and we have soul-stirring emotional preaching, and it stirs up people's emotions. And, and sometimes, my friends, you have Bible workers who, who go to these communities, and they work with these individuals weeks and couple of weeks and couple of weeks, brings them to a point where they're ready to make a decision. And at the last minute, when it's time for decision making, when it's time to go into the water of your baptism, the person says, no, I don't feel I'm ready to get baptized. Whatever is in between the person and their decision for Christ prevents them from coming to Jesus. But why does people feel they're not ready to come to him? Because Jesus says, come just, come just as you are. Come to him. You know, he, when, when he was calling the disciples, they were in the midst of their work. And he says, drop all these things and follow me. Well, did they have time to prepare themselves for Christ? No, he found them in their work. And he says, drop your work and come and follow me in your dirty, fishy state. Have you ever gone to a seaside to smell fish? The raw. Are you listening to me? These men were raw. They were at the seaside. Jesus called them and said, come, imagine the stench on them. They didn't have time to go and take a shower and then come and follow me. But what keeps people back is that they, they can't give up what they have. The friends they have, the parties they used to go to, the life that they have, they can't see themselves giving it up. It's the same predicament that this young man finds himself in. The social circles that he was in. How can I give this up and follow this man who was so hated in the first century? I'm going to ostracize myself with my friends, my social circle. I'm going to turn my back on all that. And the Greek word that was used suggests that he was not only rich, but he was very rich. He had a lot of money. A lot of possessions, a lot of uh, attainment. And, and, and this is what Jesus is talking about. A lot of times we have acquired so much in life that it seems as if the more we acquire, it's the more we push Christ away. You know, it's the more we have to wade through and, and, and cut through to get to Christ. The more we acquire stuff, it's the more things we have to cut through and, and to give up to come to him. That's why he says it's it's hard for a rich man. It's easier for, for a camel to enter the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. He wasn't saying rich people are not going to heaven. No. The point he was trying to make is that the more things we have, it's the harder. It's a, not, it's a harder task to come to him. 
Because you know they say evangelism is very popular in Jamaica, but we have a, a large population of poor individuals. And so when you're poor and you don't have much material things, if someone comes to you and, and gives you some good news, it's easier for you to respond. You don't have to think, oh, how oh, are my friends going to look at me, my wealthy friends? You know, I have so much land. I should sell all the land I have. Mm, I'm not so sure, Jesus. All this, this money I should just give away to the poor? No, no, no. I don't think I can do that. I'm going to lose my status. But which is more important for us? So status here on earth, which perishes. The earth is going to perish. Or status or land or cars which depreciate as soon as it comes off the lot. Just think about it for a second. If you have a family, if someone says to you, you can have your family and have no material possession, or you can have all the riches in the world but lose your family, which would you choose? Which is more important to you? My family is more important to me. I could have all the money in the world and have my family. I do not have my family to share with them. It means nothing to me. In fact, the woman did an interview and she said, you know what? I had everything. I had all the money, the wealth, the yachts, all, you name it all. And then one day tra um, tragedy struck. My husband died. And all the wealth meant nothing to me. That's what she said. She said it meant nothing anymore. Because I had no one to share with. She said, I would give up all this wealth to have him back. So, my friends, as this man was searching for salvation, as many people do, you're searching. You're on the verge of accepting whatever stopped them from accepting. They're like this young man who turned away from the Lord. Holding on to his wealth and going all the way to eternal damnation with heaven on his mind. Holding on to his wealth, not willing to see control of his heart and mind to Jesus, not willing to make him the driver of his life, not willing to make him the pilot of his life, but trusting more in wealth and possession and in earthly and humanly regard. Not wanting to be regarded highly by heaven. Choosing to be more regarded and highly regarded among men. What a tragedy. What a tragedy for this young man. See, we live in the midst of, a, of the most sophisticated and intellectually advanced cultures the world has ever known. Yet people still do not know the answer to the most basic and important question of all. People do not know the way to salvation. Man can split atoms and put men on the moon and harness the power of the sun, wind, and rain, but still man struggles with the idea of salvation. See, the sad fact is most people don't even hear to know. Life is too good here. But at least I give, I give it to this young man. He, he was concerned about his soul's salvation. You see, my friends, let's give this young man his due. You see, he's concerned about the right issue in the presence of the right person. He comes at the right time and he came in the right way. He, he gets a lot of things right in his encounter with Jesus, but it is the things that he gets wrong that cause him the most trouble. Notice the word that he uses, what may I do to obtain salvation. And understand, if you will, because of social circumstances shape our lives. Because he was in the social, economical, uh, political circumstances where the Jews thought they had to work to earn salvation. So he's coming from that background. Your background shapes you. He's looking for a do-oriented salvation. What may I do? A works-based religion. He wants to have a hand in it. What must I do? He wants to be involved. He wants to get his salvation himself. He wants to play a big role in getting that salvation. 
But Jesus is going to give him the shock of his life. Not only does he think that salvation has to be earned, but he thinks the salvation that he gets is a reward. A reward for what, though? He seems to think that if he can just do enough good things, then God will give him eternal life as a reward. But Jesus is saying to him, your best righteousness is like filthy rags. You could, you could, you could do the best works and you, you still miss out on heaven. Because you can't save yourself. It's a gift. It's through grace. It's by faith in Jesus. Salvation is not a reward for faithful service. When we do the work of Christ, we're not doing it to earn salvation or to get a pat on the back. We're doing it out of loving obedience to Jesus. We're doing it because we have been saved in Christ. Have you listened to the word? But this is a problem we struggle with. I'm from Jamaica. A lot of people there struggle with that. If you ask in church, how many people are short of this salvation? You don't, you don't get much hands because we struggle with it. Like, what else do I have to do? I, I feel inadequate. Well, you're going to feel inadequate when exposed to the perfection of Jesus. You know what that is supposed to cause you to do? It's supposed to stir up in your desire to be more like Him. So you ask Him to fill you with His Holy Spirit. And you shouldn't even ask him that because he's always willing. You should ask him to make you willing to accept his spirit in your heart and mind. Because he's always willing to give his spirit. It's us who are unwilling to allow the spirit to work in our lives. As this young man was unwilling to give up his wealth. See my friends, the Bible tells us in no uncertain terms that salvation is never about works religion. Salvation is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's about something that has already been secured in him, and he offers it to us freely. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. He did it all, and there is nothing you and I can add or take away from it. Jesus acquired salvation through us. He offers it to us through a faith and grace-based relationship with him, a continuous relationship until he comes again, a relationship of sanctification that prepares our characters to go to heaven. That's all we take with us to heaven. Characters molded through the challenges, molded through the fire of our life experience. What do you say? You see, he had a challenge. When Jesus hears what this man believes about salvation, Jesus challenges him in two aspects. The first aspect Jesus challenges him in is concerning the character of the Savior. The man had called Jesus good master. Jesus reminds him, my friends, in no uncertain way that there is none good but one, and that is God. When Jesus makes this statement, he's calling the young man out. Does he believe that Jesus is a good man, or does he believe that Jesus is God? Obviously, this man considered Jesus merely a great teacher. Well, you see, my friends, before any of us can be saved, we must have a correct understanding of who Jesus is. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a good master. He's not just a good moral man, a teacher sent to show us the way. No, he is God in the flesh. What do you say? He's not a way sure. He is the way. He's not a truth dispenser. He is the truth in embodiment. He does not point out the path to us. He is the path and the way in and of himself. Why are you listening to the word today? And so, my friends, as Jesus called him out concerning the identity and the character of the Savior, he also called him out concerning the condition of his soul. Coming to a close. When Jesus gives this young man a list of commands, it isn't to imply that salvation comes by keeping the law. Many people may misconstrue and believe that Jesus was saying, you have to do these things to obtain salvation. No. Jesus is trying to get this man to see that he's a sinner. Jesus is attempting to get him to be honest about his spiritual condition. Because apparently he believed that salvation was just something else he could add to his resume. But Jesus wanted him to see that he's a sinner. And as a sinner, he has no grounds upon which to stand before the face of God. 
just wants him to see that regardless of what he may possess materially, he is morally and spiritually bankrupt. And that's why he listed the last six commandments. The commandments that concern his relationship with his fellow men. Because he was claiming to have kept these commandments, but he wasn't willing to sell all he, all he had to benefit his fellow men. And in selling all he had, the first benefit was to be his. Earning treasures in heaven. That's your benefit. And then come and follow me. Even then, the young man could not see beyond his need. You see, this is where most people are, isn't it? They take an external superficial inventory of their lives and think we are all right. We compete ourselves with other people and think we are all right. You know what? I, I don't abuse my wife, my children. I don't run around. I don't drink. I don't I provide for my family. I'm a good person. And after all, compared to some people, I, I'm pretty all right. But how can we compare ourselves with other sinners and think we are all right? We need to compare ourselves with Jesus. What do you say? And then we see our true condition. And then the need and the desire is stirred up in us to, to strive to be like Jesus through the power and enabling of his spirit. What do you say? You see, the young man had a confession. The man responds to Jesus' challenge by telling Jesus that he has kept all the commandments in his youth, and he probably has kept them. And so Jesus didn't rebuke him for his claim. But there's something else we need to consider. It may be that Jesus mentioned the commandments that the young man had kept. Perhaps the Lord did not mention the ones he had broken. Because if you notice, my friends, all the commandments listed, as I said before, is about man's relationship to man. But what about man's relationship to God? He never had that connection to Jesus, that hard relationship with Jesus. He wasn't surrendered to Jesus. He wasn't in a surrendered relationship with him. He wasn't in a saving, uh, grace and faith relationship with Jesus. And that is what Jesus was telling this man. Jesus was saying, listen, all the things that him and you put them to one side and then come and follow me. You're not ready yet. Go and take away the hindrances from your life. Go and put them aside and then come and follow me. Because then and only then can you follow me in spirit and in truth. Then and only then you can follow me in a way that is not of hindrance to you. When you listen to the word of God. Just put aside all that easily beset you. All the things you're caught up in. Go and put that aside and come and follow me. Because just to say, listen, you're not ready to follow me. That's his response. He wasn't ready. The disciples were because they dropped all they had and they followed. They were ready to respond. This man wasn't out of, out of place when he was ready to respond. Because Jesus knew his true condition. And he might have gone back, even though scripture doesn't record it, he might have gone back and, and later on in his life come around got rid of those things that distracted him and weighed him down and came to Jesus. Scriptures didn't tell us, so we can't assume, but he might that. But he wasn't willing and ready in that moment to surrender. Finally, his sorrow. What was his sorrow, my friends? Because when Jesus hears his response, Jesus reaches out to him. Notice Jesus didn't condemn him. The Bible says he loved him. And that's the attitude we should have as we minister to others. As we remember that we were also sinners. And we're saved by grace. The only difference between us and people in the world is Jesus. Not us. Not our works. Not our degrees. Not our money in the bank. Not the houses we have. The cars we drive. Not the places we live. But, but Jesus. And so we need to understand that if we are to be like Jesus, we have to be quick to love. Quick to understand. Quick to be empathetic. Quick to be sympathetic, quick to be understanding, and slow to hate, slow to try to, 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 to cast down and to fling mud and to cast as person. Are you listening to the word of God? 
Because yes. Jesus, even in the man's state, had compassion for him. His first response was to love him. We're told that Jesus loved him in spite of his sins, in spite of his improper understanding of the things of God. Jesus loves this poor lost sinner. You know, sometimes we fight over issues in church. We fight over doctrinal understandings. We fight over foolishness, I call them, things that are not salvific, things that will cause us to lose our way, but things that will not help us to, be, to, 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 to go to heaven. Right? Listen to the word of God. Fighting over, 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 over some minor stuff. Because we want to be right. We want to be right. We want to say, I we have the, the truth. Is that a badge of honor? Is that an identity marker if you don't have love for souls, love for people? Are you listening to the word of God? In spite of this man's shortcoming, Jesus loved him. And that's the only way he could have gotten through to him. Even though the man went away sorrowful, he couldn't go and say, you know that those Christians over there, no love. No love. The way they dealt with me, I'm not going back there. He couldn't say that about Jesus. Because Jesus still loved him. See, he's told to sell what he had and give it all away. This will guarantee him riches in heaven. By, and by these acts, he will demonstrate he had no other gods before the Lord. And he will be reaching out to his fellow man. Thus, he will be working toward keeping all the Ten Commandments, not as a legalistic practice, but a spiritual exercise, one that is a response to the grace of Jesus. What do you say? And so, my friends, as we listen to this word today, we need to understand certain things. The first thing we need to understand is the man's rejection. See, this man was looking for an easy fix. See, you can go to some churches or even watch the church on TV and the preachers are preaching some the things that people want to hear. You know what I'm saying? Go to some churches, if you're not preaching what people want to hear, you're going to go to another church. Jesus wasn't preaching what he wanted to hear. He was preaching what he needed to hear. Well, you listen to the word. See, the man wanted to keep all the things he had he wanted to add Jesus to his resume. He wanted to add Jesus to say, you know what, Jesus, I want to keep these. It wasn't a negotiation. You can't negotiate salvation. You're a sinner in need of a savior. You don't have anything to negotiate with. You are not having any credit in the bank. This is the way it is. Accepting Jesus through faith. That is it. No negotiation. Oh, God, you know what? Let's come to the table. Uh, you know, I want to keep this. I just want to keep it here. It doesn't work like that. We're not negotiating here, Jesus is saying. This is the way it should be. But this man, instead of making a, an eternal decision, which he did make an eternal decision, but he also made an earthly decision. He chose possession over Jesus. He chose the love of money more than his desire to be saved. He also made an eternal decision because one day his youth would have faded, would have been gone. He would have retired from his prestigious position down at the synagogue and finally age and disease uh, might have taken him over and even his vast wealth couldn't prolong his inevitable, inevitable death and he, he might have died. And when he did, he found out that his religion and his moral lifestyle was not enough. All the wealth he had on his deathbed, he might have realized, you know what? All the wealth I have, I can't bargain my way into heaven. I can't exchange my billions of dollars for heaven. I can't exchange my billions of dollars for health. Because your health is more important than your material possessions. Are you listening to me? If you don't have health, what do you have? These are the things, the intangibles. These are the things that matter in life. You listen to the word of God. As far as we know, my friends, this young man died. By the tell us that he came back to Jesus, he died. And he secured his faith in his eternal damnation. But today, it's a lesson to us. The wealth we have and we acquire is to be used to bring blessings to the cause of God. 
is to be used to bless our fellow man. It's to be used to enhance the work of God. What do you say? That is the important thing. Because when you die, what are you dying and leaving? A name, a legacy. How people will remember you. That person did this, that person did that. The person's name lives on. Because you know what? This person, even though they were rich, they were so kind, they were so loving, they, they shared their wealth, they contributed, they donated to good causes, to the cause of God, to build up the kingdom of God. That is what you want to be remembered like. You don't want to be remembered like this person was so mean, this person was so harsh, no love in their hearts. And most importantly, you want to fashion a character for heaven. In your family life, a training ground. With your children, a training ground. All this life is a training ground for heaven. A training ground in your relationships, a training ground in your workplace. All of it, look at it as a training ground in your stewards. What will your stewardship be like when God comes back? Will you have been a good steward? Or a poor steward. If you want to be a good steward, allow the Lord to work in your life. What do you say? Amen. The gracious Father in heaven, as we listen to your words, words of life, words of salvation, words of hope and joy, pray, oh God, that we will not allow or wealth, or material possessions, or material things, to sorrow our characters, to, to make us be at odds with our fellow men. What about instead of making and causing our wealth to be a deterrent for eternal salvation, I pray, oh God, that we will understand that all wealth and blessings come from you. And because of this, O oh God, we will have the stance, the, the attitude of gratitude to you for these blessings. And in an act of thanksgiving, we will ensure that we use our wealth for the further of the kingdom. And also we will ensure that our wealth goes to the blessing and the edification of others. As we foster a character that is worthy of heaven through the indwelling daily sanctifying work of your Holy Spirit. Keep us humble. Give us a heart that desires spiritual things. Increase in us a love for the spiritual things and decrease in us a love for carnal things. Nobody help us to fasten our eyes on you and walk in with, with uh, precision in on you, O oh God, that we, O oh God, will not turn to the left or the right, but we will be steadfast in our commitment to you. So that when you come, O oh God, when you shall roll back those eastern skies, and when you shall put in your appearance here on earth, O oh God, we will be among the number called upon the sea of glass, and we, O oh God, will serve eternity with you. This is our prayer. This is our asking. Help us, O oh God, to continue to enjoy the rest that you provide on this Sabbath. But also help us to remember that true rest resides only in your person. Forgive us of our sins, O oh God, and cleanse us from righteousness. And as we depart from this attempt of hope, we pray, O oh God, that we will not depart from your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say. Amen. Amen.